This is the Brett Snodgrass Podcast. Thank you guys for joining me on this particular episode because I have a very special friend and a special guest, Mr. Nathan Brooks out of Kansas City, Missouri. And I can't wait to talk to you about him. This is called the uncut version of Nathan Brooks. We're going to dig in, get real, and get raw. Before I talk about him, though, please go to the Brett Snodgrass channel on YouTube and subscribe and tickle that like button so you get a little giggle out there and you get all the videos that come out each week. Who is Nathan Brooks? He is the co-founder and CEO of Bridge Turnkey Investments, which is a Kansas City-based company. They do about 150 turnkey deals per year, Uh, but we really dig into not only his business and all that he does there, but we dig into he is an MMA fighter. He did a fight in the MMA. He just took up golf lessons. He's spending intentional time with his kids, so he's an amazing dad. He's a great husband, and he is writing a book right now, plus he is a musician and it doesn't stop there. Nathan Brooks is living an incredible life. Let's get real. Let's get raw. Here is Nathan Brooks. What's going on, Nathan? What's up, my brother? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I've been looking forward to this interview for like three years. So (laughs) I'm finally finally here. I've been waiting for your call. Mm. And, you know, uh, Brett, I'm so sorry. And you know what? You're, I have failed in getting it scheduled very promptly too. So that is a hundred percent on me. It's all right. So I apologize. You're too busy fighting uh, MMA fights, running 150 <laughs> deal a year, turnkey business, singing, worship. I don't, I don't know, you know, hanging out with your kids. So anyways, uh, <laughs> thanks for being on the podcast today, man. Really looking forward to this. And I got so many questions to ask you because you do so much. It's like, you know, you're not just a real estate guy, which typically most people in real estate, they do real estate, that's it. But you do so much more. And I want to dive into all that because you're a very passionate person. But my first question I always ask is, who is Nathan Brooks? Who is Nathan Brooks? Yeah. That's a that's a great question. Well, uh, I am uh, somehow made it 40. I don't know what happened, bro. But well, <laughs> you're not dead. <laughs> not dead. Not dead. There's only uh, only one way to go. Uh, so, husband, father, to uh, lover of life, and somebody, you know, I become more and more just obsessed daily with uh, what it means to actually live a, an incredible life, and uh, what are the components of that, and whether it's in business in family friends space or personally for me. And, and so just living it sometimes maybe to the edge, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I it's, to me, it's just, it's about, um, you being fully yourself, f- fully loving yourself, fully loving your life and creating what it is that you really want it to be and in, in living it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, how long have you been really thinking about this? Is this just something I obviously you just, you're 40 years old, correct? Yep. And sometimes 40 is like the age of wisdom. And we start to think about all these things and what is life and what does life mean? And what do I want my life to, to be like? Um, is this something that's like really hit you now? Or is it something in your thirties you're even, you're constantly thinking about? You know, it's definitely something that I've had awareness around. I've had a meditation practice for a couple of years now and journaling practice for, you know, even longer, three or four years. And so it's something that I've had awareness of, but it wasn't necessarily that I had, it's more like when somebody tells you something, but you don't necessarily receive the information. It's like, Hey, Nathan, Hey, Nathan, you know, are, are you actually living the life that you really actually want to? And oh, by the way, did you actually take the time to lay out what that might look like? Yeah. And what are the components of it? And so, you know, I wouldn't even say I necessarily have it solved. So I don't, but I, I have, I have an awareness of that and a desire to live a, an incredible life and have incredible experiences. And so, you know, how can I use the things that were in my life and, and uh, my business and the people around me, our team, my family and, uh, and just so I've made some you know, series of decisions around all of those things, and 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 I spend uh, a lot of time regularly thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, man. And obviously, you've been doing that because again, I kind of 
follow you and stalk you. If you see a Cadillac sitting outside of your house, man, don't don't worry about it. You know, I see it all I'm, the time. I'm journaling about you and drawing pictures. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I'd like to see him. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll put him on this uh, show. Um, yeah, please do. On the show notes. But you have a lot of passions in your life. So number one, you're kind of known as the big real estate guy, CEO of of Bridge Turnkey Investments, and you guys do 150 turnkey deals a year. And that's maybe why people think you might have been on this show, but uh, I like to talk about life, real rawness, and you have a lot of other passions in your life. You're a very passionate person. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, you talk about these components to live this incredible life. You're mm -hmm. passionate about certain things. So what are some of your passions beyond the the real estate? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I kind of mentioned this earlier, I think, but I really look at the kind of components of life in the, in the family bucket, the personal bucket and the business bucket. And how do I, you know, have experienced success and, and joy and all, and all of those things. So, you know, in the, in the family space, it's been like, Hey, am I, am I spending quality time regularly with my kids? My son's way into fishing. If you catch you know, me on social at all, you know, there's always fishing going on. Uh, and, uh, I've become an, an avid outdoors outdoorsmen, uh, you know, hunting, fishing, climbing mountains, doing crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, like you mentioned, I, I trained uh, MMA and, and jujitsu and was, you know, insane and, and, uh, took a cage fight, <laughs> uh, right before COVID, uh, which is a wild experience. Yes. And, uh, you know, just recently was in Utah and, uh, you know, learn to power paraglide. It's basically a lawnmower with a propeller on your back and you're flying <laughs> in the that. sky. That looked crazy. Yeah. I saw yeah, it is crazy. a video here right now. So check this out. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if I answered your question exactly, but, uh, you know, I find passion in a lot of things and like, you know, hunting has all of these different components, you know, from backpacking to gear, to rifles, to shooting, to, you know, you know, and then understanding like, Hey, how do you, how do you, you shoot something? Okay. Well, what do you do? I'm not going to shoot anything without eating it. That's our, my intention. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we now butcher our own animals and process our own stuff and make breakfast sausage and, you know, get crazy. So, uh, you know, why not, if I'm going to do it, I want to do it a hundred percent, just like we talked about at the very beginning of this podcast before we hit, you know, record. Yeah, no, I mean, definitely. And uh, that's something that I think we totally agree on. Like if I do something like this podcast, for example, I want to do it to the best that I can. I want you to feel important. I want, um, you know, people to love this show and just to do a little bit something different because people, again, like I don't want to do things halfway. Uh, mm -hmm. And you say you want to do things 110%. And, and sometimes it can come across a little bit impulsive. So like if I'm watching you from afar <laughs> and I look at Nathan Brooks and I'm like, man, like this guy, he just does what he wants. Uh, you know, I was looking at you, you see this really nice truck and you're like, you know what? I saw this nice truck and now I own it and I just bought it. Um, you want to do MMA fighting, which that's really, really risky, but you did it. So my question to you is, is there a line, do you think, to your impulsivity because I'm the same way. Like I'm very like, Oh, you want to go across the world and travel? Sure. Let's do it. And my wife's like, I don't know that, you know, we got the kids and stuff. So anyways, is there a line to your impulsivity? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, you know, and a prime example is I, I forgot to mention golf. So I've just recently gotten into golf. I haven't played, you know, I didn't grow up as a hunter, didn't grow up fishing, you know, so that's all, all new learning. I uh, didn't grow up. The you know, first fist fight I was ever in was in a cage in front of a couple thousand people. Uh, so, you know, I guess, I guess you really got me on this impulsivity thing, but, uh, in the truck, I literally saw an advertisement for that truck, by the way. And the next day I texted my my guy at the dealership. And I was like, you know, what would that look like? Uh, <laughs> here we are. So here we are. Yeah. Uh, I skydived like on my birthday, my buddy, who's a, who's a instructor and does tandems, you know, text me, at, you know, 7am that morning. And, you know, three hours later, I was, you know, launching myself out of an airplane. So I don't think there's probably much, uh, now I just have a clear box kind of like yeah. we do in real estate for our buy box. It's kind of like, like a life box. I haven't really used that, you know, or wh whatever, but is it an experience that I really want to have? And is it one of those moments kind of like power paragliding where, you know, I don't really even understand totally what it was. I mean, I had a concept, but I didn't really understand the, 
you know, the fundamentals of what it, what it actually took, mm -hmm. but I thought it sounded really cool. And so I said, you know, the, you know, Richard Branson, you know, screw, let's do it. Uh, let's go do it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I love that. It's because uh, a lot of times, especially when we reach a certain age, you're 40 years old, we stop learning new things. This is like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe you grew up playing golf. Now you can play golf, but you high, rarely see someone that doesn't play golf, start to play golf or doesn't hunt, start to hunt at a certain age. Uh, for me, it's actually, I actually envy your, you're a musician and you play the guitar and you're a great musician. And that's something I've always, I've always wanted to be a musician and I found myself I was we have one of the best music stores in my city called Sweetwater Music and they sell amazing instruments and I was touring it like this week and I was actually kind of thinking about you and be like man I wish that I could be like Nathan Brooks and play the guitar but that would take a lot of work and I am yeah. I past that learning stage but you is that like one of your things you just you, you love to learn new things and you're not afraid I think right yeah well and I think to that and by the way you can totally play guitar. So you just have to commit. So like golf, I was watching, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but the, the first winner from Japan won, uh, the masters and I'd, I'd been invited a lot of, a bunch of times to play golf, you know, real estate things or, you know, investor things or whatever. And I always just said, no, I hadn't put the time in because I'm, I will obsess. And so, you know, I watched this guy, you know, I never watched golf, Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'm watching this, you know, gentleman just crush it, wins the tournament. And I was like, you know what? This is it. Put a post on Facebook. Two days later, I scheduled a fitting to have clubs fitted. So because of course I couldn't decide what I wanted to buy because there were a thousand, you know, inputs. So had <laughs> clubs fitted, hired a coach, and you know, now I hit, you know, three, four, five hundred balls a week and I, you know, go play golf once a week or something. And I just set a goal to, you know, if I'm going to do it, I'm all in and I'm going to put the time and effort into it and, and have fun with it. Yeah. So I like the challenge. Yeah. And that's crazy. Cause again, 110%, it's like, okay, someone wants <laughs> to play golf. You get some clubs at a garage sale, go, go hit some balls. You're like three to 500 balls a week, get fitted, hire coach. <laughs> <laughs> let's, do, let's go. <laughs> that's that's it. Yeah. I can't I can't do it any other way. <laughs> that's all. How's it going, by the way? How's your golf game? Ah, uh, well, you know what? So speaking of golf game, yesterday. So this week, I probably I had a lesson on Monday. I hit probably two or three hundred balls on Monday. I played nine holes of golf yesterday. I would say twenty percent on the on the driver and about seventy eighty percent pretty good on the on the irons. Nice. And then I was frustrated enough with how my golf game went. I went and hit another hundred and ten balls after playing yesterday. So there you go. That's, that's great. <laughs> Obsessive. Obsessive. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, talk, talk about this MMA fighting. Uh, was it last year, right around COVID, you mm -hmm. decided, it was funny because we we're in a mastermind group together and I see a lot of things from some of the mastermind guys, right? They're doing speaking things or traveling the world or whatever, but I don't see this very often. I see Nathan <laughs> Rook's picture, MMA fight, fighting Ryan Nash. And I'm like, man, like this is super risky because especially men at our age, one of our fears is we don't want to be embarrassed and that's something like it could be an embarrassing thing. Right. So For like sure. you, you put yourself out there, talk to us about that. Why? And what was uh, the lessons that you learned? Man, there's a lot there. It's a great question. Uh, so kind of backstory. I, I was bullied as a kid, terrified to be in fights, you know, had a lot of, a lot of really awful experiences you know, basically grade school on all the way through high school and, uh, you know, being the orchestra geek and, uh, you know, a choir nerd doesn't necessarily lend itself often to being like the, you know, person that doesn't yeah. get, uh, you're wearing cummerbunds and <laughs> I, don't, I was the choir guy too. Anyways, I was the jock, but I was yeah. also the choir guy. I get it. I understand. I definitely was not a jock. I'm much more fit in my, at 40 than I ever was when I was, you know, 18, but, uh, so I always had a fear around it and I, I grew up to be a, you know, people watching, you know, can't tell how tall or whatever I'm, you know, six, two, six, three, 200 pounds. I'm fit, but I, it was like, how do I feel as a man to know actually how to handle myself and, and being a physical, uh, experience, you know, whether it's jujitsu or in a street fight or, 
uh, whatever that might be. And so I kept listening to Tim Ferriss. He had a number of people on his podcast, Jocko's podcast, um, uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. All these guys had all these jujitsu uh, people on there. And so I started to obsess about it. Shocking. <laughs> I show up to a jujitsu gym and, uh, you know, train a couple of days, a couple of times and meet my coach. And he invites me or, you know, I, I get into, uh, shocking one-on-one privates. So doing some jujitsu and I ask him to do, uh, some sparring stuff, some, some kickboxing MMA stuff. And so we started doing that training and I, I will never forget the day that I, I kept harassing him like, Hey, I want to spar. Hey, I want to spar. I remember he's like, all right, today's the day. Let's do this puts three minutes on the clock or two minutes. I don't even remember how much it was. And, um, I'd say about the first five seconds, I was really excited to be in that. <laughs> and it, and it is terrifying when you're not used to getting punched in the face. And, you know, it's one thing to have cardiovascular strength, but it's another emotional strength when you're in a situation like that. Yeah. And so, uh, I took it as a challenge. Like, I don't want to be afraid of this anymore. And so instead of you know, bailing on that. I was literally training, you know, four or five days a week, 10, 12 hours a week, doing 20 plus live rounds a week and ended up in a gym with, you know, 10 plus people in the UFC. So I'm literally regularly training, rolling, sparring, you know, kicking, punching, wrestling with people who literally do it for a living. And so I got to a place where I, I just decided I cannot do this training watch all my buddies take these amateur fights and not do it. Mm. I just can't do it, Brett. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was actually at a CG event in uh, the Collective Genius Mastermind in San Diego. And I texted my coach and I was like, all right, man, give me a, give me an opponent. Let's, let's just do this. <laughs> I may or may not have asked my wife before that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She probably remembers very clearly the answer. Uh, but uh, next day I get a, a picture and said, you want it? And I'm like, in, done. Mm. And um, so I just had to do it. Wow. So what was that like? So you're entering into this fight, very first time. Again, what were some of the feelings that you had, the, the emotions coming in? You got some friends coming in that are watching you do this. 100 plus. Brand new thing. Them. It's not like you've been doing yeah. this for your life. No, no. And like I said, first fist fight really ever in my whole life is in, in the cage. So, and I sold 100 plus tickets. I have, you know, half of them were like front row. They're all wearing shirts with my name on it. And uh, my favorite quote on the back, which is the, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, man, the arena quote. I love that. Um, and <laughs> so if it gives you an example, I spent three months pondering what my walkout song was <laughs> and I didn't even hear it because as you, I look at my coach and I was like, Hey, I'm not sure I'm adrenalized. He's like, you'll be fine. I literally walk out there. Don't hear the song. All it is is lights. And, uh, you know, whatever the coach said, I have no idea. I remember getting in the cage. I remember seeing Ryan, who, by the way, the day before I met Ryan and uh, nothing but respect for him. He did miss weight by like 12 pounds, but it, <laughs> it didn't even matter. I was like, I'm, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm taking this fight. Uh, he showed up, you know, a lot of times amateur, you know, fights, you might just have an opponent who just decides they're not going to do it. And uh, so we were, I was literally cutting weight. I lost I cut 20 pounds in about six weeks, but eight of those pounds were the day before the fight. Wow. And, um, I was in ketosis. So I sat in the sauna and literally dropped weight like that because I prepared, but he happened to actually decide to go cut weight at the exact same place I did. Oh my God. Unbeknownst to me. So he's sitting in like a trash bag suit and we are literally like three feet from each other in a sauna, me, David, my business partner and Ryan, all in the same sauna and you have all these people coming in and out like, Oh, what's going on guys? Yeah. I'm getting in a fist fight tomorrow. Who are you fighting? That guy. <laughs> and, uh, Oh, did you guys like have that dual like eye contact? No, just, just friendly. Hey, we're gonna It was just, it was just, you know, I almost probably too nice, yeah. you know, uh, and, uh, Ryan has a totally different background than me and I won't you know, speak for him, but I think he had plenty of scraps before that. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but for me, you know, I was feeling, I was feeling Jack to just do it. Mm. And, uh, and it's one thing because, you know, you get in a f fist fight. I, I lost to be clear. So it went three rounds. So it's nine minutes in the cage. Uh, and it is one of the, you know, I've, I, you've mentioned, I've played music. I played in front of thousands of people many times I've played for, you know, important people's funerals and I've jumped, jumped out of airplanes, all kinds of crazy stuff flown in the air, pair power paragliding. There is nothing 
even close to the experience of getting in a cage and getting in a fist fight. Wow. Not even close. Wow. That's crazy. So my question is, are you going to continue? Are you going to do it again? Is that something you, it's just a one and done? So I still train jujitsu. Um, I actually had a small injury, knee injury. So I haven't trained for, you know, three or four uh, weeks at this point, but I was training still, you know, three or four days a week. Um, the early class, a bunch of savages that, uh, grown men that, you know, choke each other out and, uh, and it's fun. It's, it's, it's That's a awesome. great sport. And, uh, so I enjoy it I, on the, you know, taking a future fight, you know, I hate to lose. It just eats me up. And, and after losing, you know, I, I had two days of being happy, uh, just did it. And then just emotionally devastated that I lost after mm -hmm. putting all that time and effort. Yeah. And, uh, go ahead. You say yeah, something? no, I, I was just, um, one of the things that really hits me is because, uh, it sounds like, you know, number one, I thought you just, you loved jujitsu. You loved fighting. You grew up doing that stuff as a kid and you know, all this other, all these other things, you're just a risky adventurous. You like your adrenaline going a hundred miles an hour. But I, when I hear your story, it's like, this is, was a big fear for you. And is that like one Huge of the things of you, like you, you need to face your fears? Yes, absolutely. It was a hundred percent. Like, I am not going to think about this anymore and wonder, I am just going to go face this. And, and I will tell you, I mean, there were literally days I'd walk out of the gym when I was in fight camp and I mean, I'd be in freaking tears, you know, you get punched in the face enough or you get injured. Uh, it's, you know, anybody who watches the UFC and, um, uh, you know, doesn't, hasn't ever been in a jujitsu class or felt what it felt like to have a pressure from somebody, uh, you, you, you can't say anything. Yeah. You have no business, uh, because <laughs> once you understand what that feels like and what the training feels like and what it feels like to have, you know, somebody put their 200 pounds with a knee jammed into your solar plexus or, you know, mm -hmm. punch you in the face as hard as they can, uh, repeatedly, like now you understand really what that feels like. And I had to just deal with it and face it and suffer through it. And, um, I call it the uncomfortable bucket. Yeah. Like you just got to, you got to reach in there and, and, uh, get uncomfortable. Is there anything else in your life that you're facing your fears on? You know, I do that. I think regularly, like for instance, in the hunting world, you know, it's one thing to go out on a day hike. It's another thing to pack all your stuff on your back and go out for a week or two or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just, just literally this year I went on first unsupported, you know, we hiked five and a half miles in and out in 24 hours. Just, it was just an overnight. Mm -hmm. But, you know, everything that we hauled in there, you know, rained in the middle of the, of the trip, lightning and thunder at 10,200 feet. We had to put up a camp. I'm soaking wet. I don't bring the right gear. I'm wearing a trash bag up the rest of the, you know, couple of miles, you know, so I think from that perspective, it's, it's, you know, there's so many areas go play on a golf course. I mean, I, I played yesterday on a really nice golf course. There's a bunch of people playing and my buddy, and, you know, I just, in a situation where there's three guys behind me watching me, you know, tee yeah. off. And, um, and by the way, you know, all three or four holes that they watched me, I sucked. <laughs> I mean, it just sucked. It always like one... happens. He had a chili dipper, top it. Like, yeah, it just, dude, I dribbles. just top in the, yeah. <laughs> right in the water, you know, just like brilliantly bat. And, uh, but you know, I, I mean, that's why I went and hit another 110 balls. Right. Yeah. And of course I smashed the ball every time, you know, most times after that, but, uh, <laughs> I'm constantly looking for it. Yeah. Golf is such an interesting sport. It looks so easy, but it is so difficult. Um, yeah. awesome. I want to transition to, I've been watching you for the past several months, really spin intentional about spending one-on-one -on -one time with your kids. You mentioned your son, you take him fishing. You're out five o'clock in the morning going fishing. <laughs> you guys have caught some fish. That I don't even know. They're so big. I don't even know how big they are, but they're just crazy. And it, and you also do the same things with your daughter. You're going out to uh, breakfast with her and stuff like that. So I don't know. You kind of just have been this really intentional dad lately. Was there something that really hit you? Because this has been a problem amongst entrepreneurs uh, because we're very focused individuals. We like to win. So and we're focused on our business. We win at our business, but sometimes in that we sacrifice our loved ones or our time with them. But you've been very intentional lately. So talked about that. Yes, I have. And you know, I, it was kind of the first of the year, January uh, this year, and we're still making great money. I live in a beautiful house. I drive the fancy car, you know, all the things that you 
experience or kind of like you said, uh, in the investor community, uh, but all that stuff doesn't really matter to your kids. Mm -hmm. They don't care. And so having the intention around, if I was my son or if I was my daughter, what are the things that are important to them? And am I actually listening, you know, as intently to what they're asking from me as I do in a meeting where I can go make a million bucks or build some houses or whatever? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no, it was definitely no. And all of a sudden I had that realization where the kids, you know, continually asking what was dad's response? I don't have time. I got a meeting. Mm-hmm. I got a phone call, mm-hmm. whatever BS excuse that came up. And so just like anything I said, okay, this is a problem. We need to identify it as that. And so I started having that intentional time with Colin and my son and my daughter and, and literally saying, all right, well, once a week I have date on the calendar with my daughter, Mm -hmm. we go to the park, we go get freaking ice cream, uh, whatever she wants to do, having breakfast, like you mentioned, we're going to do it. She gets dressed up like a princess and it's (laughs) daddy daughter time. Mm. And same with my son, right? He wants to go fishing. Awesome. Let's do it. 5.00 AM. Doesn't matter. I don't care because all of a sudden those experiences that you have transform the way you visualize yourself it transforms the the quality of your life. And, and all of a sudden saying, you know, people say I, I the hustle, the hustle and grind thing drives me crazy. And I know we're going to talk about a, the book at some point, but this is in alignment with that. I, I cannot stand. You are telling yourself a lie that you're working hard for your family, but not spending it with them. Mm, yeah. It's just not true yeah. because all that money doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And we know all that we know all kinds of people who spend all their time saying it's for their family, but it's really not. Mm-hmm. It's just about themselves, right? Go ahead. Yeah, no, um, that's I've been thinking about this a lot too for the past year, and you're exactly right. There was a quote that had a guy on the podcast named Jeremy Pryor, and he quoted this, and hopefully I don't butcher it, but basically he said that only in Western culture can a man be great at his career, leave his family in ruins, and still be considered a great man. Yeah. And I, that just like hit me. And I was like, I, that is not true. I don't want that for my life. No. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is, and that's where it comes back to, you know, individual for me, success for, for my family and for my business. And, you know, it's, it's not success if it's not across all three of those things. Yeah, exactly. And, and then I'm finding, you know, joy and satisfaction in my own life. And it, I, I had a great new, uh, we, we have uh, new coaches in there. Um, I always butcher the name, but SEAL team leaders, I believe is what it goes under, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, def- the definition of success or their definition of su- success is, um, you know, experience of, of joy, you know, that's sustainable over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, or for he me, he was like, actually at our last uh, CG. It was a Larry. Yeah. Y- Larry. I'm going to butcher his last name. Yeah. Yach Yeah. Yeah. And he did talk about that because he said, you know, some of the biggest joys and, and happiness that he found was when he was in the seals living in horrendous conditions yes. versus sometimes he doesn't have joy when he's living in a very comfortable home. And he was like, what, what's going on? And um, yeah. And and then are we actually taking those observable emotions and feelings and naming them? So once we name them, then we can address them. If Mm -hmm. we don't name them, we're not. And, um, and so that's where it's like, Hey, let's, let's take, let's take what is actually important. And and in that case too, for my kids, it's like, you know, my son loves Legos. My daughter wants to play with dolls. Like, what does it matter? Yeah. (laughs) It doesn't matter. (laughs) Like go play. And then I don't have time. Well, why don't you have time? Put it on your freaking calendar. Yeah make it important. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. It's awesome. And uh, if you guys are listening in, it's so just being intentional, you're intentional about your business, just to be intentional about your family as well. Um, Nathan, uh, obviously we talked about talented musician. I've heard you play, heard you sing. You're awesome. You've led worship. You have a love for music. And so what does that like mean to you? Obviously you've went this other career. It's more possibly a hobby for you now, but Yes. I, you know, music's in my soul and I, I knew it when I was a a young man. So I started playing string bass, uh, in fifth grade 
I remember seeing it and like everybody had to start with the little violin. I'm like, no, 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 no. I want the big one in the corner. Like, give me that one. Uh, I like and I'm going to hire free- a coach and I'm yeah. get it custom fitted for me. <laughs> <laughs> I've owned many basses and many guitars. Uh, I actually didn't start. I played, I started playing piano around the same time. So I played piano and, and bass, a string bass. And then uh, in high school, I uh, started playing electric bass, maybe, maybe middle school. I'm not sure these days, but, uh, you know, played in the symphony, played in, uh, in, in pep band and jazz band and got to, you know, tour and sing in really cool places. Uh, Carnegie hall and, uh, air force Academy has this incredible place we, and you got to sing. Uh, but you know, music was one of those things where I could, <laughs> I'm sure my parents, by the way, can you imagine me as a kid and all the things, uh, what they've dealt with for years, but, uh, I always think I'm going to figure it out. Uh, (laughs) but, uh, I remember, you know, looking in my, my piano book and and thinking like, man, I I really hate this lesson, but you know, I'm going to make up my own stuff. So I've always much preferred playing and, uh, certainly got into the sacred and secular world, you know, both playing, I played bars and the whole late night thing and toured and had songs on the radio uh, regionally, which was cool, but then also, you know, got to work as a worship leader at the largest United Methodist church in the U S so, um, which was really cool experience. And, and, um, so it, I have music forever. Uh, I still play, I still have a, you know, a grand piano that sits in my house and get to play for the kids or play for myself. And, and, uh, it just gets to be the thing that is a beautiful part of my life instead of having to be a financial, uh, resource that creates actual uh, income in my life. Yeah. Well, it's just awesome. Again, we're talking about all these things that you're passionate about to live this incredible life. And uh, I think that you're, you know, when I look at everything that you're doing, I'm just like, you know, anybody can do these things. You just have to really be intentional about it, which you have very much been, which gets me to the next point. So not saying that you do everything, but it's like, I'm listening to all these different things. So you do sports, athletics, you fight, you're a musician, and you're also a very talented writer. You're very creative. You wrote, I write a lot of blogs for bigger pockets. And I was like, Nathan Brooks has to have a book. So I was like, so I Googled Nathan Brooks book. And here was the, (laughs) here's the title that came up. The barriers of taboo begin to fall an erotic story for a hot adult. And I was like, is that is that the Nathan Brooks? <laughs> I don't. I don't think it was. But anyways, that was the that was Nathan Brooks, the author. <laughs> okay. But okay. To- hold on. So I I'm certain I'm 99 percent certain that I know who that is. And uh, for the many years that I was a church musician, I, I always told people not to Google Nathan Nathan Brooks because there was also a gay porn star, Nathan Brooks. And so uh, I was like, not me not that guy. Uh, and, uh, so no, that is not my book and that is not the title. Uh, thankfully we'd be having a very different conversation. Right. But you are right. You are a great writer. It is your superpower that you've said in the past. And a book is coming out that you're in the process of writing. And it's talking about some of these things we've been talking about. You're living this. You're experiencing this incredible life. And then you're putting it down for other people. Talk yeah. to us about your book coming out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for asking on it, too. I, so for, for a couple of years now, I've been obsessed about the idea of writing and uh, I'm somebody who, you know, I read a book or two a month. I've been on the audible subscription thing for some time. And, and, uh, so that changed the game for me too. I, I would fall asleep reading a you know book in the hand and I can hammer away at 1.5, 1.7, two, you know, speed yeah. on audible. And I tried it. T- I tried it at two and I was like, Oh man, I got really got to use that. Some books I can, <laughs> but some books yeah. it's, it's, I can't do it. This is too much. Yeah. <laughs> so 1.7 is like my sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, but, um, I just retain way more. And so I, books change my life and there's a lot of amazing books. We could do a whole podcast on books. Uh, but I, I just, I had to write one. Mm-hmm. And so, um, just like everything else we talked about, I'm sure you're going to be shocked about this. Uh, I went and hired a coach. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and so the last six months I, I literally went through her program. It was a pretty large investment too, you know, and it, but it was one of those things where I wanted to have the experience and set myself up in the mo in the best possible way. Mm-hmm. So I did, you know, f- about 30,000 words of pre-writing and just for that app, ad- people listening, like the average book, you know, 50, 60,000 words, something like that. Um, you know, 
bigger stuff, you know, there's bigger books, obviously, but yeah. just the average book you're reading self-development and that sort of stuff. And so, and then I wrote the book in three weeks, the fastest she'd ever had. My coach had ever had one of her people <laughs> write a book. So I wrote 72,000 words in three weeks. How many hours a day is that that you're writing? Um, well, I averaged about 2000 words an hour writing. So what is that? 30, 35 hours, something like that, maybe 40. Mm. And so I took like two, three, four weeks off, came back to the book and read it, read the whole book cover to cover. And Brett, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it. These I, are your thoughts, but you just, it wasn't cohesive. It was what, rushed. Yeah. It was aggressive. Like, so all the energy that I have didn't manifest into elegance and words. Gotcha. Yeah. And I love to write, like you said, I've written for years for bigger pockets. I've written hundreds of thousands of words for them and, uh, and other stuff. And I love writing. And so I literally had this conversation with my coach and she and I agreed. Okay. I said, okay, I'll write, rewrite the first quarter of the book. Well, that ended up being an entire rewrite. So I re rewrote the entire book a second time, 66,000 words. And I finished it last week. Mm. Um, so yeah, a total of what is that? Well, like a hundred, go ahead. I was just say, hopefully when you reread it, it's, it's, it's something you like. Well, I knew <laughs> when she responded to me after the first like chapter or two, and I won't repeat what she said because she'd probably be really embarrassed, but, uh, it was like, Oh wow, <laughs> this is a lot better. <laughs> and, uh, and so what's cool is I had a whole process and I had a coach to work me through all that. And yeah. so the book that it became only was the book it could be because I wrote, wrote it twice, you know, mm -hmm. and I had to get it out once yeah. and then I could have, uh, the reflection on, on how I want it to be or not. Yeah. No, I love that. Is there any like estimated time this might be coming out? Uh, yes. And well, no. Okay. <laughs> so we won't it, it goes, it, no, no, it's fine. No, we're good. Uh, so it goes through now the cool part about working with her, her name's Ashley, by the way, and I would send anybody to her. Uh, she's awesome. And now it goes through uh, an editorial process. So I will literally have my manuscript, all 13 chapters, ready to rock a, a, a book that's you know written completely. And most authors come to find out don't even have a book that's totally written. It's not ready to go. It's certainly not edited. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's future book ideas as well. So this this bad boy could be you know a franchise to the future. And so we uh, I'll be able to present and submit it to publishers in the next say 30 days. And uh, the goal is to you know have have a have a publisher and then have a publishing date. And at that point, I'll release the title and all that stuff with it. Awesome. We're looking forward to that. And uh, definitely we'll have you back on the show when that launches. So that'd uh, be awesome. Sounds good. So last question before we go, last section of the show is this. So again, you from afar look, look like you're living an extraordinary life, taking risks, doing all these crazy things, uh, awesome business, intentional family, doing kind of what you want, having a lot of fun, living out your passions. But and we talked about this already. We talked about some of your fears. You're facing your fears. But like right now, Think about you're 40, maybe you're 70s. Think about 70, 80 years old. You're starting to, you're in that fourth quarter. Is there a fear when you're at that age that you have when you would look backwards? Is there a fear in you? Mm. You know, it's so interesting that with that question, I was literally sitting with our COO, Abby, eating lunch an hour ago before we started recording this and, um, there's a death in their family and, and, um, he was in his eighties. And so we actually just literally had this conversation, uh, an hour ago. And I think, you know, for me, it's, it's not necessarily one thing, you know, I said to her, I'm not ready. Like I, I'm, I'm a religious person, like from a death perspective, I'm, I'm not scared of death by any means, but I have a lot more living to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is it? What is the line? Shawshank Redemption, get busy living or get busy dying. And um, I got a, more, a lot more living to do. And so, you know, I think for me, it's, you know, I want to be an amazing father, uh, amazing husband. I want to have an incredible business. I have philanthropy goals. I want to give away a million dollars a year before I'm dead and set up to be able to be in perpetuity. Uh, I want to be an exceptional business owner and I want people to look back and say, I, 
I didn't just work for a company. I worked for a guy who really cared and, and mm -hmm. a company that really did something awesome. And so I think those are more the things I'll obsess about new stuff and I'll have cool new ideas. And, mm -hmm. you know, at 86, I'm probably not jumping out of an airplane. Maybe I am. I don't know. Getting in the fist <laughs> fight. Uh, might be wily, might be crazy, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think for me, it's just, I don't want to lose focus of living well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just comes back to you, you again are very intentional and it sounds like you, when you know, everything that you just said, when you're looking back, it's all about the relationships. You talk about the family, you talk about the people in your business and you wanted to treat them well and lead them well. And, uh, I think to me, it's just like, you're a very relational person. It's all about, about people and the relationships. So when it boils down to, you like to do cool stuff too, but, uh, I think it's the relationships that matter. So absolutely sounds good. Uh, Nathan, I know we didn't even talk hardly about any of your business. <laughs> Number one, we're talking about all of the cool stuff that you're doing, but you also run a very successful business bridge turnkey investments, and you have a new product that is launching and coming out. So tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, how fun is that to be on a podcast and, and we really <laughs> spend no time, but, but the cool part and part of my book too, which I can't wait to come out and, uh, is, aligning what your business does with the life that you want. Mm. And that was something that I had to change. I had to, I had to pivot. And so, uh, to be able to have my business in a place that's, that is serving me is serving our clients, serving our team, uh, and understanding what that actually means. And so, uh, it's cool. We, we actually, we're not shooting to do as many, you know, turnkey houses this year. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're, we're even focusing more and more in new construction than just renovations. And so we've built out, uh, our renov our new construction department and, uh, we're on pace to do, you know, 60 or 70 or so in Texas. So we actually have a second market and we will do, you know, in 20 uh, for next year, uh, you know, do 60 or 70 new construction homes in Casey as well. So, wow. um, but, uh, we're launching a fund and called bridge wealth fund, which is really, really exciting to me because we've had a lot of interest and in a lot of, uh, you know, folks who wanted to come to us and work on the turnkey side, but we just either couldn't deploy the amount of capital or didn't have the inventory. So now we have something that's really awesome scale, uh, that people will be able to, uh, you know, invest in and, and deploy money into and, and with a company that not only, you know, cares about them, but is doing cool stuff. And so, um, I'm excited awesome. about that. Awesome. So that's bridge, uh, bridge wealth fund. Yep. Bridge wealth fund. Bridge wealth uh, fund. We're literally, yep. The bridge wealth fund and, and, uh, bridge turnkey is our website. Um, so we'll have something where you can sign up and get some more information there. And, uh, and we look forward to yeah. thank you for bringing it up and look forward to being able to yeah. help folks with that. Definitely. So go check that out or bridge turnkey guys. Uh, if you're interested in that and number one, like when I invest money, I do investing and lend money and buy houses stuff like that. But I always like to lend, at least when I take my own money and lend it to someone else or invest it with someone else, I always like to look for someone that I has character, integrity, trust. I definitely feel that from you, Nathan. So appreciate you sharing that today. Um, yeah, Nathan, I you. end every show with a, just a few questions, fun questions at the end here. So this is called the fire round. So I've got four questions for you. Number one, Best book recently read. Oof, best book recently read. Okay, I am gonna go with. Uh, I read this book a couple times, but I recently read Atomic Habits again. Uh, actually, I'm gonna do two. One that was best book, and one was most a reminder of change needed. How about that? Mm. Um, so Atomic Habits, I love. Uh, the, I always try to take one thing, by the mm -hmm. way. So reading a bunch of books and everybody, you know, I, I hear all the time, I, I don't know if I can re you know, retain yeah. everything. Don't worry about it. Just take one Let's thing. One, yeah. Just one thing. And uh, so the, the, the sta uh, habit stacking where you get up and you're like, okay, well, habit stack for me, get up, you know, brush your teeth, uh, journal, meditation, go for a walk, uh, you know, make my tea, all those things uh, go together. Right. And it's mm -hmm. easy when you're like, okay, well, if you don't put them all together, but if now they're all attached, so it's almost like you're doing one thing, but it's really five things. Mm. And so I love that. I love also, it. we'll say I reread for the 10th time, rich dad, poor dad. And I realized how much stuff he's missing in that book. Mm. And 
not just relating to getting rich, which is great and all, but actually like, what are you doing about it? What's your life look like? What kind of person are you? Mm. Uh, what kind of life did you create? And so, you know, it's interesting re reading that and, uh, and kind of feeling a different experience with it, frankly, and, and, um, you know, being inspired. Go ahead. No, I was just saying that's really interesting uh, because, again, I mean, I read that book a couple times, but I probably haven't read it in what? I don't know, 13 years. A, a while. Yeah. yeah. I did yeah. the same thing. Yeah. And I was like, man, I don't feel the same way about this book anymore. <laughs> and uh, well, it's so. funny because I gave a presentation to an entrepreneurial uh, high school class. I was asked to do this presentation last week and I said, I want to give him a book. So I bought 25 copies of Rich Dad Poor Dad. But again, I, I, I read it 13 and I was like, I hope this relates to him today. So maybe, yeah. maybe it's your book I'm going to give out next time. It's my book next All time. Right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, number two, your biggest adventure. Biggest adventure. Um, hmm. Well, I'm going to go, I mean, there's a number of things and we've talked about, you know, them. I think, I think from the perspective of the wildest, longest tenured experience was definitely MMA training mm -hmm. and, you know, people understanding again, like I said, if you're a, if you're a UFC fan, go take some, go take a little jujitsu and just experience what it's like to have somebody around your neck and learning how to not to panic and, and, you know, being in a sparring round where somebody's kicking your leg, like a baseball bat smashing against your thigh over and over and realize that how strong mentally we can become and how physically strong we can and, and how much our our, our thoughts and emotions, if we don't have awareness of them, control us subconsciously mm -hmm. and, and run and, and ruin, uh, you know, people's state or days or weeks or months or lives, because we don't, we don't catch up to it. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, martial arts was, was just a beautiful thing for me, uh, to transform in it. And it really changed how I looked at a lot of things, uh, mm -hmm. because of it. Yeah. Crazy. You're very graphic details wise. I'm like, I, I, I don't think I, I don't know if I can do that, but <laughs> get a baseball pad against the leg. That's interesting. All right. Number three, out of all of your hobbies, which one is your favorite? Mm. The one I'm doing today. Uh, you know, I don't know if I could define it as favorite. Uh, I definitely cycle. So right now I'm, I'm most obsessed about golf and hunting. Mm. So but I hear a song on the radio. And so I want to go and sit down at the piano and play it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know, my kids come home from, they both do ballet with a ballet school. And so they're like, Hey, I want to show you to move. I'm like, well, I can play, I'll play for you. Right. Uh, so I don't necessarily have one that is a favorite. I just, I appreciate being able to go from one thing to another and have a space to do that with. Yeah, definitely. All right, last one. So I know you've been fishing with your son a lot, and I'm just interested. What is the largest fish that your son has caught? Okay, largest fish. So we, over the last few months, uh, we have fished in uh, Mexico. We fished in Hot Springs, Arkansas. We fished in the Ozarks. We fished farm ponds in KC, uh, and we've caught probably I don't know ten or fifteen different species. And there's one called a spoonbill. Uh, which is this giant prehistoric looking thing that has this giant um, like paddle for a, for a nose for, and I think that thing was like 50 or 60 pounds. Wow. And, That's crazy. Um, do you have a picture of that? I do. I can send it to you. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to ask you, I'll, I'll shoot you an email on that. That'd be great. I'm going to put that in the show right now. So check this it's out. Cool. Guys. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. It was fun. And, we, and he also caught like a 30, 40 pound catfish uh, recently and uh, oh. I caught a 15 pound. Um, that's like striped weighs bass. as that's weighs as much as he does. <laughs> <laughs> it's big, man. Wow, it's it's wild when you see him. That's yeah. awesome, awesome. Well, hey Nathan, this is a wrap to the Breast Iron Rest Podcast. I appreciate you so much, man. It's been awesome. Love digging into you and your life. Can't wait for the new book to come out, guys. Go check out Bridge Turnkey if you want to get interested in what they are doing, especially the Bridge Wealth Fund. Check it out on the website. So thanks, Nathan. I appreciate you, Brett. Thank you so much for having me, man. 
Thank you so much for checking out the Brett Snodgrass channel. If you like this video, please slam on that like button. And if you really like it, then subscribe to our channel here. And remember to leave us a comment below, and I'm going to try my hardest to reply to all the comments. Thank you guys so much. This is why I do what I do. Every single week, I come out with content that focuses on success, freedom, and living out your purpose. Thank you guys so much. See you next time.